Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and live it out within our world to your glory. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. These are the words that the Apostle Paul writes to the first century church in Philippi. And I guess it's fair to wonder whether that word always also includes us 2,000 years later, especially in the year 2020. If you're not sure, I'd just like to remind you that Paul writes these words while in prison. And about the same time that Nero is beginning to toss Christians to the lions for the entertainment of his people. You see, our joy is not found in our present situations, that's for sure. But in our trust that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ sustains sustains us in the world as it is at this time. And one day will transform our world into what God always intended it to be. I'm glad that you're here to join us for worship, children of God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, you have prepared a table before your people and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people clothed with humility and compassion. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Our service continues with our scriptural readings. A reading from the book of Isaiah, the 25th chapter. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make you all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, a rich food filled with marrow, 
of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lord, this is our God. We have waited from him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Judea and I urge Sentish to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled besides me in the work of the gospel. Together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, those names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in the everything by prayer and sublimation, with thanksgiving, and let those requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Jesus Christ. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
like to share with you a parable from Matthew 22. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they did not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Those who have been invited, look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calf have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm and another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? and he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The gospel, the good news of our Lord. Thanks be to God. So that's the good news. What we're thankful for to God. So where is that good news in this parable as recorded from Matthew? It starts out okay. We have a king throwing a royal banquet with all the usual people invited, um, the prestigious business people and community leaders, the royal court, um, the royal court of the person marrying um, the prince, uh, all those who had influence and power within the kingdom, I'm sure, were invited. But this is where things get a little weird. Um, having received an invitation for a royal banquet, those who are invited when the slaves come to tell them it's time are busy. <laughs> they are working on the farm or or they're doing uh, business deals, or, or some of them don't even give excuses. They end up mistreating the slaves and beating them, and, and some of them are even killed. And the king is outraged by it all, um, denying this royal invitation. And so he, kill, he sends his troops to kill those who murdered his slaves, and and he ends up burning the city. And then he calls his remainder of the slaves together and says, we have this festival all set. We need to have the hall filled. So go out into the main streets and get whoever you can, good and bad, and let us celebrate, let us celebrate. And so they gather the people and the banquet hall is full and the king comes in and he sees this one guy um, without a wedding garb on, wedding robe. And so he calls him over and says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he didn't answer him. And, and so he was bound hand and foot and tossed out into the utter darkness. And apparently, the wedding or the marriage feast continued. Good news. Where is the good news? Okay, um, I think one thing that is very understandable in this passage is that uh, the political and religious leaders of the day um, refused Jesus' invitation to to listen and to learn from him. And so there are consequences to that. 
fact, and uh, we understand that. But what about this poor man who has no robe on? Um, why is he bound hand and foot and thrown out? He was invited at the last minute. Maybe he didn't have an opportunity to, to have a robe um, or to at least wear the robe. We don't know, but it sure seems like the king overreacts uh, to this per poor person without the proper wedding garb. Clearly there is more to this story than the attire uh, that he was wearing and that all of the people were wearing um, in the marriage feast. So what is Jesus and what is Matthew up to in this parable? Well, this parable and the two before it speak out against the, um, the established religious leaders um, of the day who failed to respond to Jesus' message of, um, of the Messiah and of this new life that he was bringing to the world. There was conflict going on at that particular time and so it isn't surprising that Matthew takes this parable and, and uh, highlights that part of, of what's going on. But he also adds this section um, at the end about this man who is tossed out of the, the feast that the Gospel of Luke in his parable does not include. And in so doing, I think he's challenging the fledgling church to to maybe look at things a little differently. Um, and, and I think he's challenging us to do the same. One of the things that um, we struggle with in, uh, in America is that we have this um, Christian cultural story of Jesus that, um, that is not something that that has the depth or, or the understanding of what Jesus came to do and to be as the Messiah. And so it goes something like this. Um, if someone asked you, why did uh, Jesus come and what did he do? And, and the response is he died on the cross. And then you ask, well, why did he die on the cross so that my sins would be forgiven? And why is it important that your sins are forgiven um, so that I can be saved. And what does it mean to be saved? I get into heaven and celebrate eternally there. Faith is all about in this cultural understanding about getting into the banquet, about ending in heaven. And I find out that as a pastor, sometimes I have an opportunity to talk to people who have grown up in the church but have kind of isolated themselves now. And a lot of times they'll freely uh, tell me that uh, they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior uh, back when they were younger and they know that they're going to heaven. That is the results of this cultural um, Christian understanding in, in America. And it's what we in the Lutheran Church call cheap grace. If we receive an invitation to this royal banquet and we RSVP that, yep, we're coming, we don't get to sit back and wait until the time comes when Christ calls us home as an individual or or when Christ comes and returns and brings the kingdom of God down here on earth. We're not just like um, once you receive Jesus Christ, you go to this waiting room that is our lives until we start this salvation, this new life in heaven. <laughs> if you listen to Jesus Christ, if you listen to Paul, if you listen to even the Old Testament prophets, you discover that um, God's action within our lives is not somehow to sweep us one day up into heaven, but so that we can live differently here and now. 
so that we can follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ in this radical new way of living that changes us and our lives and ultimately changes the world that is around us. We discover that Jesus says we're the salt of the earth. We are a light in the midst of the darkness. We are to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ from the day that we come to faith to the day that we go into the kingdom of God. Paul puts it this way in our lesson. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And he's writing these words when he's sitting in prison, not knowing what his future here on earth will be. And he's writing to this faithful congregation who is just beginning to get the effects of um, Nero's persecution of the church, which ultimately will lead probably some of them to be thrown to the lions for the entertainment of the emperor. That joy that Paul is talking about doesn't come with the circumstances that we find ourselves in, but it comes because we have come to believe that the words of Jesus Christ and the promises and the assurance that he gives is our definition of our reality. Of, of who we are and what life is all about. And that allows us to find a sense of joy and peace and hope, even in the midst of the world as we experience it today. What does Jesus say at the end of the Gospel of John? He says, I have came that you might have life and might have it abundantly. And that life doesn't begin when we die and go to heaven or or when the kingdom of god comes down here on earth that kingdom that abundant life begins as we hear these words of jesus christ and we believe them to be true and we begin to act upon them to see in them a whole new way of life different from the way of the life of this world we are invited to this banquet and challenged to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ each and every day of our lives. It turns out that, that we are called as Christians not from believing that we are invited because we follow Christ, but believing that in following Christ, we experience life in a whole new way here and now. And that, that's the good news. The good news is that salvation begins now as we begin to reorientate our lives to the coming kingdom of God. And that in Lee indeed puts us in a place where we begin to see that kingdom break into our world, even as we speak. And so, as we look at this parable, and as we wonder what this ending means, maybe we discover that it does matter what we wear, not in that parable, but in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. We are called not to wear complacency, to conform to the ways of this world, or any kind of garb that somehow shows that we are content with the way this world is. No, we are called to wear a sense of faith and hope found in Jesus Christ in words that come to us, not from a great teacher, but from God himself. I'd like to read to you Paul's description of what we should clothe ourselves in, found in Colossians 3. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, 
Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to which indeed we are called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The good news is that with this invitation to the banquet comes an invitation to live differently here and now, to be a part of what God is up to, and to know what will last and what will not last as we transform into eternity, into life with God. And so, the good news is found in this invitation of Jesus Christ, not to wait until we are saved, but to realize that Christ died and rose again so that we might live new here and now and might indeed be the light of Christ shining within our world. Together, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we share together our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Share that peace with our world. Amen. As you can see, we are worshiping in person. For the rest of October, our services will begin at 9 a.m. and will be in the garden as temperature allows and as the weather permits. Otherwise, we'll be here in the nave worshiping together. But either place, we do take precautions. We physically distance from one another and we do wear masks throughout the whole service. So please keep that in mind. And I hope that you'll continue to join us online or join us in person as we celebrate our Lord at Zion Lutheran Church, 5th and Market Streets in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. It is with confidence in God's grace and mercy. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious Lord, fill your church with a spirit of joy, even in the midst of a pandemic and a divisive election. May we remain true to your way of life and find strength, hope, and guidance to follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, as creation waits with eager longing for redemption, protect your creatures that are mistreated. Restore valleys, mountains, and pastures, both still and running waters. 
Be with those affected by fires out west and flooding in the south. Help us to understand our part in caring for all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious host, as you set a table in the presence of enemies, so bless the efforts of diplomats, international peace workers, and world leaders who navigate conflict. May they proceed with dialogue and understanding so that justice and peace prevails. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforting Lord, let your gentleness be known among those who are weary or ill, especially Ryan, Coy, Shirley, Joe, Matthew, Riley, Jack, Toby, Vern, Janessa, Sandy, Jake, and Ashley. Be with all who are infected by the coronavirus. Strengthen doctors, medical care workers, and caregivers who see to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious provider, when we are quick to judge outward appearance, remind us how you clothe us all in your mercy. Be with those to whom the world is slow in extending your grace and love. We pray for ministries that provide needed clothing and personal care items to those within our community and those who seek justice for all who are oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Giver of life, as we remember those who have died and are gathered at the heavenly banquet, comfort us with your presence. Assure us of your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call to you, O God and enfold us in your loving arms, all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. With all of this craziness going on around us, don't get caught up in it all, but put on Christ in the midst of the darkness. I'd like to share with you um, a reading from Colossians 3, where we hear what that means. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, which, to which indeed you are called in the one body, and be thankful. What an example that would be to the world all around us. And so please be well. Be faithful in living out Christ's love. And may God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Live as Christ did, with humility and compassion. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.